Hey, everyone, Brandon. We will uh, talk about the book in a few minutes. Get you guys all in tune here. Um, so if you can, grab your book. And we'll go through those last four chapters in just a few minutes. Class. I put one upstairs for you. You need another one? Right. Go. No. Hey, Caleb. Good to see you. Oh, uh, Caleb, if you go on to our uh, the COVID page on Futuristic Lid, I think I talked about how you can get into Remind. Yeah. It's right after the picture of spring break. It's got a an arrow on it. Um, the district's making us, all the teachers, use it. I think your father's connected to it, not necessarily yours. He used every student email and every parent email. And um, so it will show you how to get notifications in there that come to your phone. But all your teachers are supposed to do it twice a day. Uh, there's a code on there for you also, and we'll get you caught up. It's good to see you. All right. The way this has been working, Caleb, is if you, uh, I post them on YouTube, you can watch them later and you kind of send in, um, you send in uh, an email and we'll do that today. Okay. All right, Caleb, I'll, I'll give you credit for watching the YouTube doing that now. Uh, generally, um, what you do on these things, you open up uh, an email and you send me, uh, as we're talking, you type down some things you learn and then you email it to me. And that's your that's your credit for being here. That's what we've been doing. Um, so with that, we're going to get started. Uh, so. Uh, also, if you missed any of the videos, everybody watches them later on. Hey, Cortland, good to see you, buddy. All right. And all. Yeah, Cortland, I need, uh, remember, I have, um, uh, I need your work from three through eight. Brandon, checking that out right now, bud. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. The idea of those early assignments on YouTube was just to see how it worked. Uh, also, I have uh, I started doing Classroom, Google Classroom, but I don't really think it's going to be necessary for us to do it. Uh, I had about 22 of these in there. Um, after we get done with this book, and we're going to be done with the book this week, because there's only a few pages left, there's one section left. The um, Google Classroom is great for communication, but we're using Remind. Google Classroom is also great to put tests in. I did one, um, which is fine, but we're gonna do the capstone the rest of the year. So there really isn't any sense of having another uh, platform to deal with. So Cortland, make sure you're uh, getting me in that work, okay? And so let's talk about uh, year 22, okay? If you've got any missing YouTube assignments, you just watch them, take notes, and then send them in, all right? Um, I'd like you guys to start. We're going to start on Chapter 9. The uh, I wanted to point something out to you. Ah. There's a... Uh, There's a poem referenced right in right in there. Uh, it's called. Uh, this it has everything to do with when Ish is recovering from his illness, and of course, the big tragedy has occurred. Two tragedies, actually. One was the fact that they put a guy to death for a crime he has not committed. That is uh, that was the subject of the conversation last uh, last year.
Uh, well, I'm trying to get that light out of my face. But um, and the other tragedy is that uh, Charlie brought sickness, and that sickness ended up killing a bunch of people. And one of the people killed was Joey, and that is not good because Joey was the key to civilization. But on 280, the very top. He says, when he could think more calmly, the irony of all things impressed him more and more. What you were preparing against, that never happened. All the best laid plans could not prevent the disaster against which no plans have been laid. He's actually probably alluding to one of the, a famous poem by Robbie Burns called To a Mouse. And uh, it's a real somber poem about a little mouse trying to make a little nest for the wintertime and the farmer, Robbie Burns crashes his plow through it and destroys the whole thing. And of course the mouse is now going to freeze to death. And the end of the uh, poem says uh, the best laid plans of mice and men gong off the glay, which is Scottish for often go awry. And it's also the title of the book of mice and men by John Steinbeck, but he's probably referencing that the best laid plans of mice and men. So here they had everything was put here. Good to see you, Ashley. Everything was put here. We just started, by the way, Ashley. Isher was putting all of his hope into Joey, and Joey's gone. Um, Isherwood is coming to the realization that probably his great plan to rekindle society is not going to happen. And you, as the reader, are starting to learn that George Stewart probably thinks it's a good idea that civilization doesn't rekindle. Some of the comments down the stretch here by Stewart through the Inicolaries and through Isherwood and others are quite stinging about society. So, for instance, there's a bit of anti-religious sentiment on 281 where Isherwood begins to regret putting a man to death for a crime he hasn't committed. And he says, he says this, right? Remember, Isherwood's not particularly religious. He says, uh, maybe it's because we killed Charlie. Maybe we did something. Maybe God struck us back. An eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth. That's a line right out of the Bible. And uh, maybe God killed Joey because we killed Charlie. And then, of course, M nearly kills him because she says to him, not you too. I faced the others often when you were when I was alone and you were sick. I knew no arguments, but I knew it could not be so. I could not give them arguments. All I could give them was my courage. And She's mad because here, Isherwood is a man of science, right? So is Stewart. But here you have, um, and, and if, if, if you remember, he made fun of that earlier in the book where he, he thought that, um, that these people have been spared. Uh, some of the, like uh, George and Maureen thought that they were spared because they were good Christians. And he's like, so God killed everybody else uh, and just left you too. And that has been a bit of an age-old debate um, in all of Christianity, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. You know, um, in whether you truly understand or not, they all come from the same religion. Um, Judaism is the original; that's Jewish faith. Christianity splits off from Judaism, but Islam also splits off of Judaism. 700 years or so after Christianity does. So when they talk about God, they're talking about the Old Testament God. That's that's all is Muslims, Christians, and Jews. And so this has been going on in civilization since the dawn of time. What happens when a plague comes through? God's mad at us. When an earthquake happens, did we do something wrong? Uh, even so, not that long ago with this, um, I think it was in 2000 when the tsunami hit Indonesia, there were calls from Muslims saying that, the Muslims have been bad. And so God wiped out a whole bunch of them in Indonesia. I mean, that's Christianity went through that with the black death, the plague that God was mad and was, it was punishing them by, by wiping out the population. So M dealt with that stuff while Isherwood was sick, but she does not want to hear it from him. And that was just sort of, a he wanted to sort of reiterate that moving on. Um, quite dark nature. Uh, on the bottom of 282, top of 283. He says, uh, this is in the italics part, and it's pretty grim, but he says, perhaps there were too many people, too many old ways of thinking, too many books. Perhaps the ruts of thinking had grown too deep 
and the refuse of the past lay too heavy around us, like piles of garbage and old clothes. Why should not the philosopher welcome the wiping out of it all and a new start and men playing the game with fresh rules? This idea that Stuart is espousing that the world might be better off if man was just gone um, in our own world, especially when you start talking about and dealing with um, global warming, you start to, when you study things like the great Pacific garbage patch, um, you start seeing what the hand of man has done. You can see where some authors would proje project sort of attitude that the world would be better without us. Right. Uh, moving uh, through here, the symbolism of the hammer, very big indeed. Um, this is 284, 285. The hammer, which is in the very beginning of the book, and I told you it would be all the way throughout, and it is at the end. Okay, how you doing, Owen? Um, you only missed the first few minutes. You can go back and watch it later on. We're on 284, 85, and Earth Abides. Um, it's just about how he takes the hammer to the funeral, the celebration of all the all the dead. And um, it's interesting because George has takes them out to um, the spot where all the graves are, but he takes them there before the sun comes up. And he gives a speech about all the people and the good of all the people, individual little stories, anecdotes about all the people. And he's doing this as the sun's coming up. That's very that's a symbol that symbolism goes back to the dawn of man, dawn of a new day, the sun rising, all a fresh start. But in that com in, in that preaching that George does, he never mentions, um, he never gives any traditional words, you know, never says any nothing that sounds like the past. He also doesn't speak about hope beyond the grave. He talks about those people as good people and just makes a reflection that this community is going to move on. It's the dawn of a new day. And at the bottom of um, 285, he even says, the first edge of the sun had risen above the ridge line. Ish suddenly did not know whether to be pleased or dismayed. Well planned, but a stage trick, he thought. The return of the sun, the, that age-old symbol. Ezra had been, uh, I said George, sorry, it's Ezra. Ezra had been too honest to promise immortality, but he had chosen his timing and had the luck of the clear morning. Whether you thought of a personal resurrection or merely of the continuance of the race, the symbol was there. So Isherwood's not equating this with Christianity. He's equating it with, with hu human nature, that we must move on. It's the dawn of a new day. But that being said, something major occurs, right? Um, if you go to 289, one of the big... Um, issues that and this is the kind of stuff that i want you to email me that you heard that we talked about but this is a, a perfect example at the bare, bottom of 289 isherwood says um now nature had become so overwhelming that any attempt at its control was merely outside any one circle of thought and this line is very important you lived as part of it not as its dominating power so he's saying you you're part of nature. You're not, you don't control nature. That is not the way modern man is. Modern man wants to control nature, wants to control everything. Um, you know, that's why we build dams. That's why we, um, that's why we irrigate. I mean, we want to control how much food we grow. I mean, it's the, it's the mark of the modern man. Um, winding down here is only a few more things to cover. Um, the library, he goes back to the library. It's overgrown. He doesn't make he does makes no attempt to go in there and um, get any books. Uh, he is uh, about to make a big decision with school, which is ironic because we're here we are. Um, line uh, two hundred ninety three, the quotation they mentioned Thoreau, but the quotation is what a strange thing then is this great civilization that no sooner have men attained it than they seek to flee from it and. Um, in AP language, my 11th grade class, we spend a lot of time reading philosophers who talk about leaving civilization and getting away from it. There's been quotes in here. Um, in fact, the very beginning of year 22 starts that way about, about the fact that there are all kinds of uh, Native Americans, or excuse me, 
uh, white Europeans who live as Native Americans and no examples of Native Americans living like white Europeans. And um, he says, um, uh, he, he compares uh, society to Frankenstein's monster, an allusion to literature. There is, um, he says, man is now quieter. Again, uh, um, there's all kinds of indications that Stewart thinks that a sort of cleansing of man might be a good thing. I believe some of you read Fahrenheit 451 your sophomore year. And uh, notes don't need to be long at all, Cortland. Just a couple things we talked about, you know, and uh, just jot down some things we're, we're talking about today. You're welcome to ask any questions, and I will answer them just, just like right now. Um, you're talking 10, 12 things, and you email it to me, okay? Um, coming... Coming to chapter 10, Isherwood closes school, and he closes school forever. He's done trying to rekindle. Remember, he tried to teach him mathematics. He tried to teach him about music. He tried to read him poetry, plays, and stuff like that. They didn't care about any of it. All they cared about was cow tipping, relaxing, having some food, burning matches, throwing uh, cartridges of uh, bullets into fires and watching the fireworks. They didn't care about any of that. So he closes sort of school, college prep school, and opens up basically vocational training. And what vocational training does he begin to teach the kids outside of the classroom? He teaches them how to make bows and arrows. Okay. Again, here we go. You have so much attention being paid to the simplicity of the Native American lifestyle, juxtaposed with the destructive nature of modern man. And now here we have our Isherwood at the end of the book. He gives up on it all. He gives after Joey's death, after the birth, right, of the state in which the state voted to put a man to death for a crime he had yet committed. Isherwood says the heck with it all. Everybody else already did. Okay. And now he's teaching them how to hunt, how to fish, how to make a bow and arrow. And at the end of chapter 10, the boys kill their first rabbit. OK. And now he is teaching them self-sufficiency, nothing about rekindling civilization, nothing about um, uh, getting it uh, uh, back to the way it used to be. So Cortland, a good example, since you asked, you know, something we mentioned, Isherwood, we talked about how Isherwood closed the schools. That's what you would type up. We talked about Isherwood closing schools and he's teaching them vocational training. How to make bows and arrows. That that was that was what we're discussing. And um, eleven is very short, um, and basically starts to reflect that uh, the time is going to be passing. And then we get into the quick years. And the quick years is kind of funny because Stewart has ostensibly finished the book. He's he's made a statement, kind of like Starship Troopers, where Heinlein made all of his statements, and so then he gives you 60 pages of combat with a very quick ending. Here, he's going he's gonna to wrap up the book. The climax of the book, and this is, could be in the notes, the climactic moment of the book was the killing of Charlie and the subsequent death of Joey. Those, are all, those both happened at the same time. Now it is the falling action, and the last American is the denouement, or the conclusion of the book. So if you think of that... Everybody, you actually start here. You got the setting, then you got the hook, the rising action, the climax, the falling action, the denouement. The last American is the denouement. And um, the quick years, he just kind of whips through. Evie finally dies. Um, they talk about whether, you know, it was good to keep her alive. They actually have a vote to actually move in with other people. That's a big deal. Um, M is the big reason, the voice of reason of why these young men need to have wives. Um, they need to further the race. They need to, uh, they can't be isolated and protected anymore. They have to risk disease. She even says, this is a really good line. Life is not lived by denying life. It's actually a pretty good line. Be a good bumper sticker, maybe a tattoo, right? On your forehead. See there, Cortland, that'd be something you write. A good tattoo for the forehead. Um, 
She says, our grandsons and sons will need wives. Okay. Perhaps death will come, but we got to face it. All right. We're not going to hide. All right. And uh, notice again, another comment, very slight comment on race. Who's the voice of reason many times in this book It's the African-American woman. Okay. He doesn't, it's there. And we talked about that before school closed. Um, Stuart makes a, a pretty strong comment, as uh, strong as a comment about race relations as you probably can get away with in 1949. And then finally, just kind of rounding it out, people start dropping dead. And towards the end, the last two, M dies on uh, 309, O oh, Mother of Nations. Um, and he's a little obviously sad. He has a good, strong relationship with her. And last is the last alive are Ezra and um, and Isherwood, and they're getting old. Uh, in fact, he says uh, in 309, we are going, we are going. We Americans are old and are dropping like last spring's leaves. So they are getting toward the end. Because you remember, it's, it's year 43, right? I mean, Isherwood was 25 when, uh, you know, when the plague hit. You know, he was, he was a college grad student. So he's, he's in that age. So he's, you know, 65 to 70 years old and 1949, that was getting along. And, um, you know, now all Isherwood does is sit on a hill and watch everybody go by. He holds his hammer, um, but it's very difficult for him to, uh, to lift. At the end, on 313, he realizes he's sort of become like a, a god, a deity, uh, almost uh, in old ancient Greece. There's oracles that were up on the hill. Uh, he says, at that thought, last line on 313, he gripped the handle of the hammer, which in these days was very heavy for him to lift, even with both hands. All right. Um, Rendon, welcome to the party. Yeah. Bravo. All right. Brendan, I want you to eat. We're, we're almost done with this uh, session. So I want you to email me and you and I will communicate. Um, but uh, we're going to get you caught up. Okay. And I'll tell you exactly what you got to do. Good to see you. Uh, I'm going to mark you down. Make sure you subscribe, Brendan. And I'm going to do that grade right now. Are there any questions from you guys right now? Uh, I'm what I want you to do is finish the book and I got a couple questions for you to answer on our page. But the last part of the book is called the last American. It's kind of a weird ending to the book, um, but it, it has a fitting end. Uh, there's a couple things that I want you to comment on, but you'll have to go to the novel page. I'm, I'm looking at it real quick and then we'll, we'll break this session down. Called uh, yeah, there's only a couple questions to do on the last American. Okay, so if you get that done, um, Brendan, my uh, my email is my first and last name at Gmail. Um, here, I'll type it in. Okay. Oh, we got Edwin is in here too. Nice. All right. Any of you guys that have been a little out of the loop for whatever reason, there's the Gmail. Um, email me uh, after this. Let's get everything up uh, up to snuff. Yeah, Brandon. I, I even if you watched it live, you know a couple of things that we talked about today and sending them in to me, and then I I've got record of it, and then I put it in for you. You've been doing a great job. A lot of you's been doing a great job. Um, I will end with this. Um, we're going to start, we're going to, I'd like you to have that book done by Friday and answer those questions um, and just have them for Friday. When we meet on Friday, you can put some notes at the bottom and then send it in to me and then we'll be done with the book. Um, we'll have a discussion about it Friday. We do, we can do noon again. And then we need to start working on the capstone and we'll have some classes on the capstone. And, um, you know, if we come back to school my hope is that we get to do Jurassic Park together. Um, and so if we get going on the capstone and just about get it, get it in a spot that we need, if we do get to come back to school, even if it's for a week or two, uh, I would love to be able to do Jurassic Park with us. 
uh, uh, Caleb, let me give me a second here. Send it to my Gmail, Caleb. I'm sure. Caleb, that's perfect. That's all we've been doing. Just having a discussion. Cortland wants to... Yeah, I got the Cortland tattoo comment. Good. Uh, Malachi, good to see you, bud. Um, if you just send me an email, because there's a lot of... Um, uh, I got a couple of students that are working during the day, and they're watching these things at night. Sometimes I wake up in the morning, I got four or five people and I can tell that they watched it. Um, so yeah, just send me a couple of things we talked about. If you join late, just, just go watch through it and follow along in your book. It's just like a little class. Um, we'll be doing a lot of these for the senior capstone to um, just to make sure we're doing research together. And, um, but right now let's concentrate on finishing the book. So by Friday, and I'll put this on remind, I'll also put it on the COVID page on the class website, but, Finish the book by Friday, which is not a lot. Answer the question that's on the website. And then say, when we meet Friday, type a couple things out, send it all in at the same time. All right? And uh, anybody else have any other questions? If not, you guys be good. And uh, hopefully we'll get back to school. We'll get to do uh, at least a couple weeks of our senior year together. All right? It's good to see some of you. It's Cortland and Edwin and Brendan. All right? And uh, we'll get you, some of you are behind, but we'll get you caught up. All right, Caleb, good to see you too. I'll talk to you guys soon. Uh, Friday noon, Caleb, and I'll put that out there. That way you little, you little angels can get your beauty sleep. All right. All right, I'll talk to you guys. Uh, all right, thank you, Malachi. I'll talk to you guys soon. Be good.